Hamstrom or Deuter Matt or whatever, I don't know. So the term cinematic has become contentious in gaming. For many, it besmirches gaming's own accomplishments, like film was inherently better. But that doesn't mean games can't still learn from cinema. And in fact, many of gaming's landmark titles were influenced by a single director, Mr. David Lynch. David Lynch is best known for bringing surrealism and expressionism back to the mainstream with films like The Elephant Man, Blue Velvet, and Mulholland Drive, as well as the groundbreaking television drama Twin Peaks. The show takes place in an idyllic northwest town following the suspicious death of a teenage girl. Underneath a small town glean hides a dark mystery with a tinge of the supernatural. One of the earliest games inspired by David Lynch's Twin Peaks is none other than The Legend of Zelda, and the director's influence runs deep throughout the series. Link's Awakening's director, Takashi Tezuka, planned the world in the vein of Twin Peaks's, a small town full of suspicious characters. Since then, the Zelda series has consistently followed this blueprint. Link's Awakening also heavily deals in dreams, a major fixture of Lynch's narratives. Link dreams up the town, its citizens possessing traits of his friends and enemies. More on that later, though. This idea of small-town mysteries re-emerged with Remedy Entertainment's Alan Wake. The company had previously referenced Twin Peaks in Max Payne, which featured a television show with a conspicuous look of Twin Peaks' Red Room, albeit with more talking flamingos. Alan Wake's northwestern town of Bright Falls was, of course, inspired by Twin Peaks, as was Access Games' Deadly Premonition, which may as well be a Japanese retelling of Twin Peaks. Both contain references on top of references to the show. It would take me forever to go through them all. They even have oddly specific references, like planting evidence in a motorcycle gas tank. Most importantly though, in both games there is a heavy emphasis on duality. See, Lynch can get away with being so abstract because his stories generally concern essential paradoxes. Black and white, good and evil. For example, Blue Velvet juxtaposes the 50s Reagan idealism of the daytime sequences with the stark, cruel underbelly of the nighttime scenes. The main character wavers between the intoxicating darkness and the warm light throughout the film. The dynamic shifts are often used to shock the viewer's senses. In the case of Alan Wake, there's a dichotomy between light and dark, especially in the gameplay as a flashlight helps defeat the dark Taken. The game also deals with the ideas of fractured identities as you're working your way through a story you unknowingly wrote a week before. Wake even has a doppelganger, a major element of Twin Peaks, good and evil versions of characters existing in the otherworldly Black Lodge. Deadly Premonition also deals with dualities, subverting a Twin Peaks reference, speaking to the unseen Zack, into a major plot point that York has disassociative personality disorder, splitting after traumatic childhood memory. Though not as obvious, this may be a nod to the Twin Peaks film Fire Walk With Me, which was about a child of sexual abuse battling the demons around her. This idea of splitting and fracturing is reminiscent of Suda51's Killer7. The developer referenced Lynch's Lost Highway in an earlier game called Moonlight Syndrome, but the duality concept weighs heavily in Killer7. A wheelchair-bound assassin splits his personality into seven physical entities. At the end of the game, the protagonists and antagonists are revealed to be immortal paradoxes who are destined to battle forever. Edmund McMillan similarly plays with the idea of split personalities. In The Binding of Isaac, the main character Isaac shifts between a clean, pure child and various manifestations of sin, concluding with his transformation into a demon. Isaac struggles with being an imperfect sinner, but he would be right at home in Twin Peaks or Blue Velvet, stories that show darkness exists in everyone, but that it's a part of being human. An earlier game by McMillan called Time Fuck was directly influenced by David Lynch. The game uses the duality concept to create surrealistic unease, stuck in a box accompanied by the thoughts of your future self. Essentially, you're talking to yourself. What's disturbing is how distressed and defeated you sound. In the last level, upon seeing yourself trapped, you're told to give up and kill yourself and you totally can. But if you finish the puzzle, you can escape. The box itself represents the limits we put on ourselves. The ending showing the only thing holding us back is the voices in our head. This harrowing surrealism of not being sure of your identity is further realized in the Metal Gear Solid franchise. Its developer, Hideo Kojima, once said he'd rather be David Lynch than Steven Spielberg. And like Twin Peaks, the game even features a character who's possessed by his dismembered arm. 
In the first Metal Gear Solid, we find out Solid Snake is a clone, one with predominantly recessive genes, his brother, Liquid Snake, receiving the dominant. As with Twin Peaks, the dichotomy is shown in hair color, blonde versus brunette. Metal Gear Solid 2 takes the concept to an extreme. Turns out the blonde-haired Raiden is in a simulation of the first game, being trained as a Solid Snake successor. When the facade disappears, some truly bizarre moments take place. I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in Flapjaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61. That unsettling break in reality and the panic it sets in is known as the uncanny. It's explored heavily in gothic horror like HP Lovecraft and Dark Souls. Something strange yet familiar. It's also something evident in Kojima's upcoming take on Silent Hill, a psychological prison, the player gains familiarity with a short residential hallway. A feeling of dread arises when the world changes in unexpected ways. Hey, it even features an Eraserhead baby. That's, that's really messed up. Really not cool. Kojima is taking inspiration from, what else? Twin Peaks. Also consider the expressionist values of Lynch's work. Seeing the world through the biased eyes of character, this is an essential element of Mulholland Drive, where the majority of the film is the optimistic but imperfect dream of the main character. Similarly, the Silent Hill franchise takes a character's personal demons and makes them literal. Another game that embodies the strange yet familiar is Kentucky Route Zero. Its designer and writer, Jake Elliott, has named David Lynch as a huge inspiration. The tone of his films, mixing the mundane with the supernatural, is a major element of the game in that you're traveling country roads coming upon odd occurrences. Also, this bar performance has to be an homage to Julie Cruz's performance in Twin Peaks. If not that, then the character Lula, who shares a name with the female lead of Lynch's Wild at Heart. Life is Strange is a game that wears its influences patently on its sleeve, including Twin Peaks. And in addition to taking place in the Northwest, evoking a similar small town mystery concept, and mixing the supernatural with the everyday, the game intends to take another lesson from David Lynch in subverting caricatures and tropes to help tell its story. The school is full of art dorks, skaters, jocks, and nerds, but the game's very aware of these stereotypes. Indeed, with its multiple references to the catcher in the rye, it could just as well be the biased perspective of the teenage lead, as it was with Holden Caulfield. In Lynch's Mulholland Drive, we see a prototypical vision of the Hollywood dream, but the cracks soon show, and we realize this is the overly idealistic dream of a distraught starlet who is actually living a nightmare. With the Elephant Man, the severely deformed John Merrick counters society's stereotyping, becoming a wonderful eloquent man instead of the monster the public sees him as. Gone Home is another game that plays with tropes, particularly in the gaming medium. Taking place in the 90s where emails and cell phones can't solve problems in a matter of seconds, the game references Twin Peaks. Gone Home embodies tropes to flip our expectations of the medium, exploring life through the mundane but hinting at satanic rituals in its big spooky mansion. It's a way for the developer to create tension in the comforting high school story and to also subvert its genre. Designer Steve Gaynor also said Blue Velvet informed the game's interior lighting. This talk of duality, things not being what they seem, people and places in different lights like in Mulholland Drive and Blue Velvet, it helps describe an off-maligned game mechanic, backtracking. Hotline Miami's designer, uh, Cactus, is a huge David Lynch fan, and he used 80s action movie and gaming tropes, as well as backtracking, to repulse players. A bit more Lynchian than the previously mentioned games, considering the visceral graphic nature of the director's work. Hotline is unabashed ultraviolent fun, but after the carnage, we're forced to spend a few unsettling moments retreading our steps through the bloody aftermath. Before each mission, we put on a mask and take on a new persona, like a Lynch character passing through red velvet curtains into another realm of existence. Between levels, we explore our apartment and shops in the city. As the game goes on, shopkeepers are murdered and our apartment gets covered in blood. We assume we're being controlled by some type of pantheon, but the game ends by asking why we need an excuse for the violence. We enjoy it, as we did when playing old shallow kill fests like Smash TV. Resident Evil is iconic for its backtracking, so it should come as no surprise its director Shinji Mikame is a huge David Lynch fan even naming one of his post-Capcom companies Straight Story, an ironic reference to Lynch's lone G-rated film. As you acclimate yourself to the mansion, small changes occur to throw you off. 
like the appearance of Crimson Heads and Hunters. Lynch's influence on Mikame was even more evident in his latest game, The Evil Within. I mean, I mean, it's called The Evil Within, for Christ's sakes. But what he really took was the shifting, dreamlike narrative structure of Lynch's last film, Inland Empire. Like the dreams and nightmares of Inland Empire, which cut erratically and without warning, reality is never assured in The Evil Within. Memories literally manifest themselves, and worlds are constantly breaking down and crashing into one another. Also, whether intentional or not, The Evil Within is very self-referential to Mikami's past, not unlike Inland Empire, which incorporates characters from past movies like Maholan Drive. Dreams are so integral to Lynch's work, they're the perfect expression of all his signatures in film. They're non-linear, they're strange yet familiar, they're abstract, and they're inescapable. Jonathan Blow identified Lynch's Mulholland Drive as a major inspiration for Braid because of its dreamlike tone and use of interconnected patterns. In Braid, the player pieces together a non-linear puzzle, a fantastical realm of ideas. The style is evocative of Super Mario, Tim going between levels searching for his princess, until the very end when it's revealed the princess is running from Tim, searching for a knight in shining armor. Braid also uses semiotics, the princess representing a goal that, though not evil, would bring darkness to many people. So I've covered about 17 games directly influenced by a director whose last film was 9 years ago, but he remains vital. This of course isn't the last you'll see a game described as Lynchian. A mystery adventure game called Virginia looks to bite even more off of Twin Peaks. Imagine how many more people will be inspired by Lynch when he returns to Twin Peaks on Showtime in 2016. 25 years after the series finale. But why Lynch over other directors? Maybe because games can be more non-linear, allow us to walk around in a dream, experience the uncanny firsthand. Maybe it's like Super Bunny Hop's point about aliens influencing gaming that we kind of dig 80s cynicism right now. Or a generation that pines for 50s optimism, but kind of realistic and see a lot of pessimism, a lot of darkness. But regardless of the points, it's not going to be the last time David Lynch is used as an influence for a game. And, uh, Unlike calling a game cinematic, it might actually be a good thing.